Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, Tracy, believe it or not, it all began back in 1895. I don't think I was even born then. (laughs) Almost. (laughs) That's when Wilhelm Röntgen first discovered the X-ray in his laboratory in Würzburg, Germany. And Röntgen is the guy who is credited with being the father of radiology. After all, I mean, he took the very first x-ray that ever was made, and you know what he x-rayed? I don't know <laughs> if I want to know. His wife's hand. Oh, It okay. fell off a couple weeks later. I, oh, I, I, no. <laughs> Modern-day radiologists are medical doctors who work with physicians and other departments to diagnose and treat diseases and injuries. Well, in the more than 100-year history of radiology at the Mayo Clinic, the field has seen a huge number of advances in imaging technology, things like ultrasound, computer tomography, or CT scan, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, and positron emission tomography, also known as a PET scan, all that. Actually, all that since I came on the staff, although we were starting to use CT scans when wow. I came on the staff. So that's how much that field has advanced that's how in valuable the past 30 you are. or 40 years. No, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Just that you've been here for it is what's important. Exactly. I watched it all happen. Here to discuss radiology at Mayo Clinic and the latest innovations is radiologist Dr. Adam Weisbrod. Welcome to the program, Dr. Weisbrod. It's good to meet you. Thank you for having me on the show. So some of our listeners may not know that, in fact, radiologists are medical doctors. They went to medical school. They did a a residency. And sometimes uh, a fair number of you also do special training, correct? Correct. Yeah. So uh, medical school, four years, five years in the residency, and then do a one or two-year uh, subspecialty training in a fellowship. Uh, and um, So th- that would be like I want to learn more about PET scan or I want to learn more true. about d- MRI. Nuclear medicine, cross-sectional imaging, uh, neuroimaging of the brain, uh, musculoskeletal imaging. Um, so why did you decide to become a radiologist? Uh, so I've always been very fascinated by, by two things, uh, anatomy and technology. And in medicine, uh you know, I wanted to take care of patients. That was a great way to pair those two together. As Dr. Shives said, through the course of his career, a lot of these things have come into practice. So what is it that the future holds for what, uh, what tools radiologists will have? Um, well, one of the things uh, that we had just installed one of the first uh, clinical PET MR scanners in the entire uh, country. And so we're taking, like you mentioned before, PET scanner and MR scanners. We're putting those together and we're res- really pushing the envelope for, for what we can do. Uh, PET what's, M- yeah, what's yeah. the benefit of that machine? Well, people may be familiar with a, a PET CT scanner, which is something where we have uh, the PET portion of the exam that is detecting. Uh, we inject an IV uh, intravenously, we inject a radio tracer into a patient's arm. And then in certain areas of the body, you accumulate this radio tracer, for instance, when we're looking for cancer in areas where there, uh, there can be cancer foci. Mm-hmm. So we use it to detect cancer. And often we pair that with a CT scan and we overlay those two so that we can find out with a CT scan where in the body is this radio tracer accumulating? Where do we suspect there's cancer? What we've done is we have now replaced the CT portion of that exam with an MR exam and using some of the benefits of MR and pairing that with PET. So the the PET shows you where the cancer is. The CT or the MRI scan actually gives you a picture of the cancer itself. It can, and it's done for a few different reasons, but uh, importantly, it can more, uh, the if you look at an image of just a PET without the CT or the MR, it's mm-hmm. very grainy. Hard to tell really where the where in the liver, for instance, a cancer could be. But when you use this technology, you're able to more uh, fine tune where this cancer could be, what lobe of the liver, what segment of the liver, and that can be helpful for shows you exactly where mm-hmm. and size and dimensions, etc. You know, the other big deal in radiology now is this 3D imaging. Tell us about that. Uh, <clears throat> Several years ago, uh, radiology was approached uh, to help uh, in surgical planning for a set of conjoined twins to help separate them. And we were approached to come up with a 3D printed model of their complex anatomy to help with the surgical planning. Since then, we've been requested to do a lot of other uh, 3D printed models, uh, and that practice has really grown. Uh, We've had a 3D anatomic modeling lab in radiology for approximately eight years. 
we're doing uh, over 500 models every year now uh, and it's it's a it's an industrial uh, 3d printed model uh, but what it provides us is with a true life-size uh, model or replica of what an, an organ or complex anatomy is. So, for instance, if a patient has a tumor in a kidney, you can define that kidney, where the tumor is, where those critical adjacent structures are, like the arteries, the veins, the ureter. Um, and this has been very helpful for the surgeons in doing their planning so they know before they get into the operating room they get a better uh, idea of where those nerves are they're able to actually touch this model they're able to manipulate it in space and and that can be very helpful for them uh, for their planning it's uh, just like a, a plastic model of the patient if somebody has a big tumor of their pelvis and you can go and you can study the MRI and you can study the CT and you can look at the pet but when somebody actually hands you the patient's pelvis only a plastic model of it you can see exactly it's incredible yes and, and it's been not only helpful to our surgeons but to our patients you know, it can be a, a difficult task to be able to not only describe the surgery that they're going to undertake or why there's certain risks to the surgery, uh, but also to try and show that with a two-dimensional image of the CT or the MR scan on the screen. But having a model the patient can actually hold and feel and see can really help them conceptualize what the surgery is, where the certain uh, cuts are going to be, and, and why there are some of the risks there are with those surgeries. All right, let's talk about tumor ablation, because that's something that you said uh, radiology helps us with. What is it, first of all? So uh, in our tumor ablation practice, in, uh, we hear every day until patients come to Mayo Clinic, they had said, you know, I've never heard about the possibility of tumor ablation for our tumors. And what is it? It's a minimally invasive procedure where we guide small needles with CT or ultrasound into these tumors. And... Uh, we use some needles that are called radio frequency electrodes or microwave antenna that heat up the tips of these needles to such high temperatures that they destroy the tumor cells. Or we use a cryoablation needle, which the uh, tips of the needles actually form ice that encompasses the tumor and destroys the tumor cells. You can burn it or you can freeze it. That's right. Yep. And it, it, it's incredible because you can get to sites that are very difficult to access surgically or for patients who aren't necessarily surgical candidates, but they have a tumor in their pelvis or around their hip or particularly in their spine, you can go in there and ablate the tumor, get rid of it with a needle. It's amazing. So how do you decide whether you're going to freeze it or burn it? Uh, there some of the uh, some of the decisions are made for freezing, for instance, like you mentioned, we're able to see the ice ball on CT scan or MR imaging. So when we're close to nerves and critical structures like that, it's very helpful to be able to see mm -hmm. exactly where that ice stops and where that nerve is so we can protect it from injury. Uh, liver uh, tumors are typically treated with a heat-based therapy. Uh, so it's many different factors, uh, and some of them are patient-specific and indication-specific. Uh, so uh, sometimes also uh, tell our listeners about the injection of cement. Let's say that you've ablated a tumor. What? Uh, <laughs> cement. <laughs> okay. Uh, you've uh, ablated a tumor in the, um, in the spine, mm -hmm. uh, and, but that bone is weak and uh, oh. potentially could collapse. So to keep it from collapsing, tell us what you do after you burn the tumor so or in frozen it. What we also want to do is provide structural support. And so through some of the same ports that we're uh, placing these needles, we're also able through uh, different cannulated needles to place cement that provides structural support to prevent future collapse of, like you said, a, a vertebral body. Uh, see, so I you... thought he was pulling my leg. <laughs> no. This is no. what the life with Dr. Shives is like. I thought he was kidding me, but you're serious. So you put it in, the, the cement goes in in a liquid form, and then after a few minutes it solidifies. And it, it is like concrete. It's amazing. It's pretty cool being a radiologist. I guess. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, Dr. Adam Weisbrod, radiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks so much for bringing us up to date on all the great stuff you're doing. Thanks for having me here.